So hi, everybody. Welcome to our first uh, meeting of 2020, as you just heard. Um, and today, Jane Mandelbaum from the Library of Congress is going to talk to us uh, about the digital uh, preservation storage um, environment that she's been hosting for the past few years with the, with the digital storage meeting once a year. And uh, this is a outflow from that in terms of criteria and a usage guide. And so take it away, Jane. Hi, everyone. So um, this is actually, you'll see it's a presentation that I gave at CNI uh, last, last month, right in December, on behalf of the four people listed. Um, I'm actually retired from the library, so I'm sort of act as a um, advisor and helper. Um, and I gave the presentation at CNI because none of the uh, four primary people could um, attend. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, there is a document called the Digital Preservation Storage Criteria, which also now has a usage guide. And as you see, we've uh, improved and uh, enhanced our um, project with a uh, quite a dramatic volcano logo, um, which has come in quite useful in trying to make the point about the purpose of the uh, criteria. Um, I also speak quite quickly, so if I'm speaking too quickly or you have questions, I'm not sure what happens next, but um, ask, feel free to um, break in. Um, so we're going to move to the next slide, and Lee is nice enough to drive the slides. Okay. So um, the, this is a little bit about what the purpose of this document is, and as you'll see at the very end of the presentation, um, the documents in question are available on the Open Science Foundation uh, website for everyone to look at, um, and the documents are a sort of continuing um, open set of documents that are available to people in the community to use um, as they would like, and that is the goal of the project is to make documents and guidance available to people in the community and to get feedback from people in the community to try to improve the documents and make them more useful. Um, and the four people listed on the very beginning uh, were four people who happened to be among the people who got together at a meeting, uh, one of the many uh, meetings of the um, digital library community and discovered in about 2015, I think they discovered that they were um, all working on something similar, um, sort of guiding documents for um, buying, acquiring, defining, specifying, describing, explaining to their bosses, et cetera, et cetera, why they needed something called preservation storage. Um, so they happened to meet together and discovered they were all having the same issue, so they decided to band together and try to create a community-based document that would be useful for people who were in the in any of those roles. And what was important to them was um, making sure that the document would be useful to people who are both consumers of preservation storage, um, people who are the users in institutions, et cetera, but also people who are providers or suppliers of preservation storage. And that's part of the goal of the document. It's not, defined, it's not designed to be a requirements document. It's designed to be sort of a list of stuff. That's often how it's defined very elegantly, a list of stuff that should be considered for anyone who might be trying to either consume or, as I said, acquire or whatever, or provide preservation storage. The other part that the group spend a, has spent a lot of effort on is trying to make it so that it's adaptable to any institutional context in any country in the world. And we're helped by having um, currently the current group includes two people from outside the United States. So that helps provide um, a sort of <clears throat> different context for those of us who often end up stuck in sort of inside the United States sort of um, methods. It helps having people from outside. We have one person currently in New Zealand and one person currently in the Royal Library of Denmark. So it's, it's intended to be adaptable to any institution um, in combination with local policies, uh, standards, regulations, preferences, etc. And as I said, it is designed to be informed by community feedback, and we do a lot of things like talks like this to try to get uh, community feedback, which I'm happy to talk about at the end. We describe, um, as I said, the site where the documents live and also how to participate with us, and I'm happy to also um, talk to people individually afterwards or at any other time, because as I said, it's intended to be a community uh, document. So one of the questions we often get asked at this point in the slides uh, is, what is your definition of preservation storage or digital preservation? And we've been using um, 
uh, one of the definitions from the Digital Preservation Coalition um, to, uh, for, in their uh, handbook of digital preservation. Which, uh, and people often then say, well, how is it related to OAIS? Um, and that definition that the Digital Preservation Coalition uses, um, in fact, encompasses some of the functions of OAIS uh, archival storage as well as some of the other parts of uh, OAIS. Any questions so far? It kind of describes the purpose of the document. Okay, next slide. I know some of you have heard these before. So as I said, um, part of the purpose of this is, um, is to ensure that we try to go out as many conferences as possible and talk about the document. So here are examples of places where the representatives have gone to talk about the document and to try to get feedback from users. So if you've been in any of these conferences, you may have heard a presentation on this before. And as Leah mentioned, uh, the Library of Congress, which, is, um, which has an in invitation-only um, annual meeting for designing storage architectures, um, this set of criteria has been presented and that has used that uh, venue for getting feedback as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, as in the uh, levels of digital preservation, which also came from the NDSA, um, the list of criteria is, is a list uh, presented in a spreadsheet format. Um, and it currently in the current, um, uh, I think the current version is, that's up on the OSF website, I think is, is version 3, and it has 61 uh, criteria. Um, and this is sort of, as you'll see, this is sort of the first one. This shows an example of what they all look like. This is number one, integrity checking. Um, and so it's intended, like the levels, to be something that is um, relatively easy to scan and relatively easy to use. Um, and, uh, and you'll see on the right-hand side um, some of the numbers about the their 61 criteria, their eight categories. We're currently working on version four. Um, and we also have a usage guide, and then there's the list of the categories over there on the right. So when, um, when we have lots of time, I don't particularly find this very, it's, we sometimes will present the entire list of 61, which is hard to do in a context like this. It's a lot easier just to look at it yourself um, and to look at the list of 61 and go through them and find, see if you find them useful. Um, but I can tell you among the things that come up when we um, talk to people about the list, um, among the um, issues, uh, and not surprisingly among a bunch of people who, um, many of whom are librarians, the categorization uh, or subject headings basically um, end up being among the topics that get discussed a lot. Um, and over time we have changed some of the categories to make them more useful based on things, comments we've gotten back from uh, community members. Um, the other thing obviously is that each of the criteria, many of them could fit in more than one category, which we understand. Um, and um, we know that's the case. And that, as it shows in the last column there, among the things we're going to try to do is try to see if we can sort of do some cross-references and cross-mapping uh, among the criteria and possibly among the categories also to try to make it um, more flexible and more usable so that people can um, sort things and use them as they want to see them. The, the categories are um, categories that just have become useful over time. They're, they're not based on any other set of categories. They were just useful for the purpose of general subject and topic um, analysis or groupings or whatever like that. Um, a description, we try to put a short description here. Um, and as I said, one of the things we're working on now is the fourth column. Um, and one of the things we're working on uh, in the upcoming year is references to other um, standards. Uh, this is not this group of criteria is not intended as a standard, but people have found it useful if they can relate it, for example, to OAIS, to some of the um, standards in the uh, internet community and some of the standards in the library community. And for example, we're currently working on ways of referencing um, what used to be called the uh, track chest checklist and is now an ISO standard. I can't remember. It's number 3663, I think. Um, so, and I'm, for example, working on some of the ISO standards, some of the, some of the information security standards 
um, in the uh, ISO um, have a lot to do with some of the things that uh, we have as uh, some of the criteria. So that's the next uh, step. And as I said, you can see the complete list of criteria on the OSF project page that's listed at the back of the uh, presentation. Okay, next slide. So one of the things that we discovered when talking to people about the list of criteria was that people found it would be useful to um, have some additional sort of helpful hints on ways people have found it useful to use the criteria. Um, as I said, it's, it's a list. It's not intended as a list of requirements. It's intended as a list of things to consider. So um, we know that many of the um, sort of bigger topics of what people do in their daily lives related to using or managing or acquiring or thinking about storage um, are things that are commonly uh, issues in both the often the sort of general IT world, but also um, general management of assets. So I think if you maybe, Leah, if you can hit the next key, I think it might, I think it goes to the next one. Yeah, okay. So among the things we decided that it would be more, that it would be useful to create a usage guide to explain to people that how the criteria might be used and other things that we have found useful either from talking to other people or references in the community as a whole, um, things that people use in their day-to-day -day work that they can um, try to use to help incorporate the criteria. So among those things are risk management, um, the risks of uh, the risks involved in uh, storage, for example, the first criteria which you saw, which is content integrity. Obviously, there are, that's a question of how you manage the risks of whether your uh, your content remains uh, the way you put it in when you get it out of storage. So, risk management is a big part <clears throat> of what people do when they try to analyze um, what the criteria are for selecting and using and providing storage. Um, Elements in establishing the safety of bits, which is sort of, and sometimes, you know, that's some ways you might look at that as a specific aspect of risk, but one that's very important to people uh, managing digital storage. Um, the independence between copies, which is also um, one of the things that uh, is a big subject as part of the NDSA levels. Um, if you um, have copies of storage, what that means and how they relate to each other and then cost analysis. So risk and cost analysis are pretty traditional um, elements of doing this kind of work for any kind of um, asset, and the other two in the middle are specific to um, some of the work that gets done with people managing um, digital content in digital preservation storage. Okay, next slide. So as an example, um, one of the things that comes up a lot when we give this presentation, one of the people talk about it is, you know, um, what or how many copies, in fact, are needed for doing bit safety. So, um, a, an example that um, is often given at by people doing this presentation is, would a thousand copies be better than three? Three is often your number that people give the answer. And then the question is. Not if they're all located in the same active volcano, which is, of course, a ridiculous example, and no one would do such a thing. But um, and it gives us an example of why the criteria and the usage guide talk about the importance of considering multiple criteria and multiple um, different aspects of preservation storage. There, that just one thing, one criterion, one requirement, often is not by itself um, very useful. And that's the other. That's the same reason we're trying to cross-reference the criteria and also try to link them um, out to other standards and things like that. Anyway, out of that discussion, uh, we got this uh, Volcano uh, logo. Um, and as I said, risk assessment is a perfect example of something. Yeah, it could happen near, uh, yeah, Nathan, that's helpful, right. It could happen near observatories with large telescopes. That is true. Um, and obviously things like uh, climate change might affect um, people's views of where they think their uh, items are safe now. We might, people might have a completely different view now of what's safe geographically than we used to have. So, 
Um, so risk assessment um, and the uh, trying to use some of the things in the uh, usage guide is a perfect example of why this. Um, we try not to tell people don't use the criteria just literally one at a time. Look at them in context of what are what else you are doing and looking at them in context of using multiple of the criteria together. Okay, next slide. Anyway, that's why we use the volcano as our uh, <coughs> slogan, logo, whatever. And any of, some of you, I think that um, I was not at the meeting, but I think it might have been IPRES when uh, the four people showed up with their uh, volcano T-shirts, I believe. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that um, that's pretty much what we're working on now. We're continuing to try to improve the usage guide. There's one. The usage guide is new, and uh, we have that out there also um, on the Open Science Framework. Um, and as I said, it covers those four topics and uh, tries not to reinvent the wheel, um, but tries to cite um, other people who have done uh, useful things in the community and other people, um, you know, even outside the community, things that might be useful to people in the community uh, in terms of risk assessment and cost analysis um, for in the context of preservation storage. Obviously, those are huge topics, and we try to make it so that we have references that would be helpful in the context of this kind of work. So we're very much looking for uh, feedback from people. That's a lot of what the group tries to do is get feedback from people. And you'll see there's a, a Google group um, that we get comments in. Or if you, you can just, uh, I think somewhere, probably somewhere, it doesn't have my, anybody's email address, but I can provide that, um, or Leah or Matt could. And as I said, we um, present these at uh, lots of different conferences. Um, again, intentionally to try to get people to uh, interact with them and provide feedback. And we do, as I said, continue to work on new versions, all of which are based on feedback um, from the community. And among the other things that we are going to work on next after filling in the fourth column on the criteria and improving the usage guide is also getting uh, user feedback on use cases. That's also a really important part of working with the criteria is having people tell us how they use them. Um, commonly, or people use them basically as a way of developing, for example, a request for proposals or request for information when looking to buy or acquire or talk about or describe what they need for preservation storage. The other way people have find it really useful is in talking to their own management about what they need when they say, you know what, I need special storage for digital preservation. And the management goes, yeah, what does that mean? Um, we found that people have found the criteria useful for just having a conversation, not being, you know, here's the list of everything I need and I need everything on here kind of thing, but just as a list of topics to bring up that helps generate conversation um, with <clears throat> program management or with IT people. And the other thing, the question sometimes we get is, well, I don't care about everything on the list 61 list, the list of 61 things, and we say the same thing, that's that's fine. Nobody probably cares about all 61, but it's a way just of having a list of things that you can take a subset for um, when you're talking to your management. Or even it's a way of helping eliminate things that you agree you either are lower priority or um, that you don't want to consider. So that's sort of the intent of how it, the criteria can get used, and those are the ways in which people have told us they've used it, but we're always interested in hearing um, actual experience of people, how they used it, because that helps us get feedback for trying to improve the criteria, um, both in terms of the number of criteria, but also some of the wording. We realize that you know, it's the nature of this kind of work is that we use where everybody uses words in different ways, and so um, Everybody, you know, doesn't think the words mean the same thing. That's one of the other topics is whether we should have a glossary, and I'd be interested in people's feedback on that also. Um, and uh, let's see, glossary, that's a common issue. As I said, the issue of what things go, which criteria, which go in which categories. Um, and then any feedback people might have on uh, particular standards or um, other reference documents that they think we should try to link to that we think would be helpful to people in the community as well. So that's where we um, are with this. And uh, I'd be interested in any feedback either now. Leah, I don't know how much time. I think I just went to, what, 22 minutes? So yeah, um, we, we definitely have time. Okay. So, so if people have comments um, or want to bring up subjects or anything, I, 
you know, I'm happy to talk about it or talk to people later. I have a question. I know um, my obsession at the moment, because it's what I'm in the middle of, is the whole integrity checking thing. Mm -hmm. We're doing it uh, with Google and it's sort of a new thing for them. There's not a lot of people doing that. And it has forced me to sort of redefine what that means for myself in terms of, uh, you know, how objects are stored in a, in a cloud storage system and what fixity means in relation to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just curious if you feel like your criteria are uh, broad enough to encompass both somebody who is actually uh, going in and directly uh, checking fixity versus someone who is um, basically harvesting what the cloud provider uh, is already doing. And so it's basically more of maintaining an audit rather than actually invoking a fixity process. Um, Cause that's, how I, I conceptualize how I've had to rethink it. And I'm just curious if, if you feel like the criteria cover both of those scenarios. Yeah, we intentionally um, tried to incorporate both of those uh, things because in fact, the people working on it themselves or find themselves often in both of those, both or either of those situations. So it, we try to word it in ways that you, the answer is it can be either of those things. Um, for example, I'm just looking at the criteria, you know, the, con the integrity checking, um, the current description, which I think is not what's on there, says it performs verifiable and or aud auditable checks, meaning yeah. you're either verifying it yourself or you're auditing what the provider is giving you. And it's intentionally, in many cases, we try to make it as broad as possible um, for that very reason. Um, and I and we also intended, as I said, to try to make it so that it's independent of what your provider is, and so it should be able to apply both to a um, one or many cloud providers and or you know sort of local providers as well. I mean, it's intended to be like that, and because it's not just a list of requirements, sometimes it seems overly broad, but that's sort of the way it's intended. It's not intended to make it so that you can. Um, turn it exactly into a requirement, but it uses words that we hope people can use to craft requirements. Yeah, I think that's great because uh, I do think it's a evolving situation that more and more people are going to have to deal with. And as, as an archivist, I know archivists sort of have to flip our brains around in terms of what that all means. So that's great. Right. That's right. And sometimes, you know, whenever, even if you think it's, you're going to do it a particular way, your management may not think that. Yeah. Um, and that's been some of the examples we've gotten from people is that the criteria is not designed to define the perfect set of um, requirements for, because we know no one has enough funding and resources to do that. Yeah. Um, but to try to, you know, at least use some words that you can find useful and that you and your management are comfortable with based on how much risk you're willing to take and how much basically money you are willing to spend on how you um, apply the criteria. Cool. I don't know if you can see the chat, but Nathan had put in a question. I can read it if you'd like. Yeah, go ahead. I can't, I'm not looking right at the chat. So. Okay, it says, Jane, could you please discuss independence between copies and how something might or might not be considered independent? What are the typical linkages in dependent copies? Are all copies in cloud really just one copy? Does it make a difference if copies are each storage in each storage service, for instance, S3 versus S3 Glacier? Right. So that that one that's in the usage guide. Um, so that's a good question to sort of look at the usage guide and see if you think that provides enough detail. Among the issues that you know, sometimes we talked about whether it was worth trying to specify the level of what you have to have as independent because often people have said, for example, it has to be, you know, run by a completely different organization. Um, and then you get the question of what does that mean? You know, the two parts of AWS, the part that runs, you know, S3 versus the part that runs Glacier, are those considered administratively separate enough? Um, and, you know, you can't, it's the same thing. It's a moving target as to what that actually means. 
And it's the same kind of thing where you would try to apply it as you, as, mu as much as you can think you can get out of it in terms of independence. But I know traditionally the independence part has meant independence at as many layers as you can get as far up and as far down as you can go in terms of things that are completely different and air-gapped from uh, the other things. And I know people who are doing cloud things, you know, when – when there are different providers, obviously that's a lot more straightforward. When it's literally the same provider, meaning it's AWS, one you know one part of AWS versus the other part of AWS, that would be a good question to you know that's an example of something that's useful to ask the provider as to what you know what level of independence they provide in terms of the administration and the hardware and all those other kind of questions. So did that answer it? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, other questions for Jane? Okay, I guess not. So thank you very much, Jane. Um, hopefully we will all go in and take a good hard look and uh, you know come up with common suggestions, questions. Yeah, I'm happy to get them um, you know now I mean an hour anytime people want to email me separately. Um, like I said, that without getting feedback from the community, that the um, you know document doesn't change, and so we need to have people telling us what works and what doesn't work. Um, so, okay, great. Hey, uh, Jane, this is uh, this is Matt. Before uh, before we switch anything over here, do you think that you could uh, say a little bit more about some of the other standards work that you're involved in? Uh, where some of that you see that going? What um, what people should be paying attention to on the standards level, particularly you as mean, um, you mean the ones the ones that we're trying to map to this? You mean? Yeah, yeah, and just uh, what your your continued engagement um, will be with the the field and with the community going forward. You mean what the group's engagement will be? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So among the issues in the group, obviously, is that it's basically a group of uh, individuals, and we have the stuff uh, posted on the Open Science Foundation framework, I mean, um, and then the question is whether over time this, um, the group's work somehow gets incorporated with some other institution or with some other, you know, organization, um, such as NDSA or something like that. That's still, I think, to be determined. So far, it's basically just been kind of free-floating. Um, but the intention of, as I said, of trying to map to other standards is to be helpful to the community, um, to try to give some context, again, to the criteria and help people sort of bolster their case if they're going deep dives into some of the other standards. So as I said, the first one I know that we're working on is what used to be the track standard, and I'm sorry, I don't remember its name in the uh, uh, ISO standard, um, the one for digital repositories. So that's the first one. Um, that we're working on, and then uh, the other ones we're working on is uh, there's a large set, uh, a growing set of information security standards um, that ISO has done. It's a 27,000 series, um, and it's a, it has, I think, 20 or something, because um, information security ends up taking over pretty much everything uh, in terms of standards often, and so I started going through some of those to try to identify ones that would be useful uh, to map. Um, there's, I think that part of the ISO standards are very, is very active, um, not surprisingly, since it's hard to keep ahead of information security. So that one seems like a very useful area um, for us to continue uh, working in. The other part is the usage guide. Obviously, if there are parts of the usage guide that would, be, that would benefit from having you know, sort of more links to standards and things like that, so that's the other part we would probably work on next. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. So Jane, it's ISO 16363, and I just put up the link for Thank you. you. Yeah, I can never remember the number. I'm sorry. Uh, that's OK. Yeah. OK, other so questions for Jane? And obviously, any other standards that people think would be useful, that would be great to get suggestions. Um, I just have a, um, a comment, Jane. Um, well, it, it's a great project. I've been following it for a while. Um, the usage guide was really nice. Um, something that um, might be helpful uh, is an example of a functional requirements document um, to help people disambiguate. Well, if this isn't functional requirements, what is? You know, uh -huh. and how does one 
you know, the, the, the adopt using the criteria to create the requirements, um, you know, what that looks like would be interesting, you know, and, but probably some time to work up some resources around, but at least if there was a comparison for um, people to look at to, to really see what they need to do with those as opposed to just having them and saying, here they are, here are my criteria, now do them all. Yeah, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good question. Do you have one you're willing to volunteer? Yeah. No. I, I, no, because I, 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 I have a list of stuff I want. I don't know if that's functional requirements or not, really. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, that's a good question. I'll see if we can do something. I and mean, that's part of, I know we want to try to um, develop some written use cases. And that would obviously be a really good one is to, you know, how you would go about doing that and what an example of one, you know, afterwards would end up looking like. So I'll, I'll ask the group about that. And that's a good idea. I could imagine one of the dangers being that, you know, you're, you're well regarded and this is a, you know, uh, a, a reg well regarded work as well. And the minute that you put something up there that could be used all of a sudden becomes you know the de the de facto standard and right uh, right I, I i totally agree with nathan that we should do it but you probably need to do multiple ones so <laughs> uh, right that's exactly right so one obviously one way of doing it would be to do it so that it was clearly a subset of the criteria yeah you know, there was not not intending to take all the criteria and make it into a full functional requirements document, yeah. but to try to. Right, right, right. You know. Yeah, yeah. Other questions, comments? Okay. Looks like not. So the, so the other, yeah, so the other one that I'm that I'm personally pretty interested in is um, the question of whether we need it, whether it needs a glossary. I don't, I don't think it would be easy to do a glossary, but I don't know if that would be useful also. I mean, I, I get what Nathan's point, and he's right, because that is what people want to use it for, but that's my other question, is whether the terms are clear enough for people or not, so. All right. Just to quickly get in there, Jane, it might be, um, if you don't want to create, recreate the wheel with a new glossary, it might just be. Right you know, looking at existing compiled ones that already exist mm -hmm. reference. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I believe there will ultimately be a, a fairly decent glossary associated with the levels of preservation. Yes. That may, you know, go a long way to sufficing, suffice what you need. Right, that's a good idea. Yeah. Hi, this is Dina. Um, I was a part of that group, uh, Levels of Digital Preservation, and we actually had a hard time defining uh, everything that in the glossary that had to do with information security. Because mm -hmm, exactly. people have different uh, meanings, people brought in different uh, definitions. So it would be probably helpful if uh, the information security was um, but the, the glossary was put together. Okay. So we had a lot of confusion in that group. I can imagine how the users would feel. Right. So one of the things that I have been looking at and um, I've thought about pitching to the group, their group is to, um, there's some glossaries as part of the ISO information standard, information security standards and trying to use one of those glossaries. So that was one idea as you say, because that's a, a level, uh, that's an area where it's difficult. So if that's a good suggestion, thank you. Sure. Okay. All right, then uh, I think we can move on to some uh, housekeeping for our next meeting and the meetings coming up. Uh, I think the first thing is to mention that uh, in February, our meeting again falls on a, a holiday, a federal, U.S. federal holiday. Uh, it's President's Day. So uh, I think the plan is to move that a week forward. Does anybody have any thoughts or issues, comments about that? Okay, so um, we'll send out a reminder before the scheduled meeting and then again before the, the 
the week that we're actually holding it, which will be the following week. Okay, and then the other thing I think we didn't get a whole lot of time um, at our last meeting was to take a look at the topics and facilitators for the coming year. Um, the, there's a link to it in the notes. Um, and so far, so I'm planning to, at the next meeting, talk about the fixity process that I just mentioned that um, we've been developing with Google and, and uh, talk, talk about the idea of fixity in the cloud, but specifically uh, related to Google. If other people have um, scenarios that they'd like to discuss relating to, for instance, Amazon or any of the other cloud providers, I would be happy to share my time. Just uh, let me know and um, you know, we can do something that isn't Google centric, which is um, what my part of it will be. And then uh, in March, uh, Nathan is scheduled. Nathan, do you want to talk about what you're going to talk about? Sure. Uh, that'll be a discussion about software-defined storage, um, which is a different approach for how you organize your volumes and logical disks um, for, for, for storage purposes um, and can give uh, flexibility in how you use storage. And, and it can also um, it all could also take on some of the basic uh, digital preservation tasks, such as replication, um, bit integrity verification, um, and some of the core things that now we tend to do in um, upper layers of that stack and the application layer that um, uh, it's, it can be done easier and quickly and, and more uh, efficiently sort of deeper in the stack at that infrastructure level. Cool. Thanks. And then um, it looks like, I know we were originally thinking we might in April going to do an open agenda call, but it looks like, uh, and, and Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, this is the most, this is updated, right? This is the most current. Yeah, so what, uh, what folks are seeing on the uh, 2020 scheduling link, uh, people can drop in on that. Uh, we have uh, Leah and uh, Nathan's topics lined up for February, March, and then uh, Courtney Mama has agreed to come in in April and talk about the, the topic that the, got the, I think the, the most votes uh, through the Tricitor uh, round. Um, and that was on the, um, the, uh, the different, different preservation levels of commitment. So um, like how uh, the levels of preservation impart themselves perhaps to different uh, classes or uh, types of content, uh, how we need to maybe gear digital preservation storage towards uh, materials a bit differently within our institutions. So, um, and there was some discussion, I think, around uh, maybe trying to link that topic in with some of the other interest groups. And we've got plenty of time to explore that. And I think uh, Courtney's on board for um, for giving some some further thought to that as well. And so it looks like we're tentatively planning on May 18th being our open agenda call. I know in the past we've tried to do. Uh, at least once or twice a year, an open agenda call. So um, May looks like will be the month for that. And then um, the rest is open and be happy to hear what thoughts people have uh, about the, the rest of the topics that we voted on. And if anybody on the call uh, is willing to uh, host one of those topics. We could get it sl uh, slated into the agenda, to the, the, the agenda board at the moment. Uh, any thoughts? Just on things I'd like to hear more about. <laughs> <laughs> so the, let's see, we, we, the one that got the most votes was Courtney, so we've got that taken care of. Um, Nathan's software defined storage, uh, digital preservation storage criteria, which we really just heard about, uh, geographic distribution in cloud environments. Um, that would be, that got uh, four votes. That would be really interesting to to hear about if anybody has any uh, particular thoughts about that that they could put together either themselves or 
a panel to talk about geographic distribution. Uh, then there's fixity, and I'll be doing that next month. Blockchain and digital preservation. Is there anybody some, on the call who's who's involved in blockchain at the moment with this? Yeah, we've got a couple of that's that surfaced uh, twice over the co course of the poll. Um, yes, blockchain and trustworthiness of digital contents, and blockchain and digital preservation. So. Between the, if you add those together, then that's a, then that has gotten five books. Um, so, even if you're, you're not, don't want to um, host a discussion about it, I'd be curious to know if anybody on the call is actually working with blockchain, just, just as a conversation, not as a commitment. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess that means no. So we need to find somebody who actually uh, is working with blockchain. So Matt and I can work on seeing if we can find somebody who can do that. Ah, somebody who wants to be testing it. Well, that's at least something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, exit strategies, another uh, interesting topic. Again, not committing, but I'm wondering if anybody has had any uh, major um, migrations at this point in terms of cloud storage in particular. Anybody having to have ha having to have gotten out of one cloud provider um, for any reason? I wonder if we could ask some colleagues at LOC to to. Um talk about that one. I know they're migrating like 18 petabytes, I think, to uh, is it a Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud, um, sort of splitting splitting that up. And so that's a, that's a large project. Yeah. Um, also NARA, because they must have had to do this with their whole new uh, system that they have recently gone to. Um, so I could ask uh, Leslie Johnson if Johnston, if she's, if that's something that she could talk about as well. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, then we have next generation storage technology, cloud compute, uh, API consistency across cloud providers, and what do all those nines mean anyway? <laughs> yes, that would be very interesting. Okay, anybody have any thoughts about suggestions for people who we might tap to see if they can talk about any of these things or any other topics that people would, are interested in that aren't on the list? Okay, well, we will continue to try to keep filling the calendar in. Um, Matt, did you have other things that we needed to talk about that I'm not remembering? Uh, well, went ahead and, um, you know, made sure to uh, leave a little bit of room. I'm not sure we'll get a lot of discussion on it, but um, you never know. Um, circle back around to the interest group charge. I don't think that there was, uh, yeah. um, there was a huge influx of new recommendations for rewording uh, to the current charge, um, except we did, I think, maybe want to, and this is something, uh, Possibly, Leah, you and I could um, could work on and put forward to the group and uh, just issue a, a brief call for any um, final suggestions or objections. Um, but just to be a little bit more intentional about uh, working in the the uh, the importance that the the cloud is continuing to take in these discussions, particularly in the area of infrastructure, and um, maybe inserting a, a word or two into the the current charge to to encompass that. Um, but even in its current form, I think it's, you know, it's still in line with uh, the work that we're set up to do uh, transitioning from uh, previous years into this next year. But uh, do, do folks have any, you know, sort of compelling uh, changes that they'd like to see made to the, the current charge? And it's linked to again there in the agenda and notes. Yeah. 
Yeah, agreed, Nathan. So uh, Nathan said we should probably just ensure it aligns with the NDSA agenda and has enough room for things. Um, and I guess it's yeah worth noting that. Uh, so I helped to co-chair the, the content interest group as well. And we have, at least for the first quarter to the first half of this, uh, this year, we're going to be taking up the, um, the national agenda and the levels of preservation um, very specifically to unpack what some of the intersections between interest and content are with those, those new resources. Um, so yeah, I think, it, I think it would be worthwhile um, and I think we have some, some room to do this over the next couple of weeks. Uh, uh, Lee and I could probably suggest um, minor tweakings to the current charge, put those forward to the group. And if folks wanna you know, step back and take a moment to consider what the, the current agenda uh, and any of the, the major resources that have come out, particularly the levels, you know, imply for how we should be focusing our conversations and the work that we do under the interest group, I think that would be worthwhile. And I think um, related to that, which we didn't really talk about at the last meeting also, was the integration of the cloud studies group into the infrastructure group. And Matt, I don't know if you have any thoughts about how that might affect the charge or um, any of the activities of the interest group. Do you want to talk a minute about it? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, so you and I have had some good offline conversations about, uh, and, and again, have had these same sort of conversations with the content interest group. It's like, you know, it's it's an opportunity for everybody here to weigh in, I think, on the degree to which we want to, um, it, you know, in, in parallel with some of the work of hearing from experts on top or topics, like what we're facilitating or set to facilitate over the course of the year. Um, if there's any work that we want to do offline, maybe in the, the way of a working group, um, you know, or however we need to, it's, it's worth noting right now, I think that the, the, uh, the leadership uh, committee, the coordinating committee is very interested in learning this year about how uh, all of the interest groups might want to work differently in some different ways, um, you know, in some different, different, in some different structures from what we've done previously. Um, so I think that there is opportunities for us to maybe over the course of the next several calls as we lead into the open call for open agenda um, slot that we have uh, set for for May. Um, for us to think about how we transition some of that work that we did in the cloud studies group. There was a very nascent group, for example, that was starting to spin up around um, actually building some resources that could be advocacy resources for institutions that are um, trying to, to do what, um, what Leah is doing, for example, um, arrive at some workable uh, audit uh, processes and protocols, um, you know, so that, that you can actually check in on your content and the ways that things are set up to um, to be handled on that level with a, any particular content provider. Uh, so I think, uh, Leah, you and I had talked about, you know, uh, maybe being a bit intentional. We could do this, I think, even in the context of your discussion, if there's room for it, you know, just having a conversation with um, all of the folks who are attending the infrastructure interest group uh, now to find out how we might want to work practically to produce some resources, you know, from this group that can assist institutions with navigating those waters. Um, now that we've transitioned the cloud study subgroup over to this infrastructure group, that's a that's a very tangible set of work that we could engage in. Yeah, I think there should definitely be room uh, to do that for sure. Yeah, and I think just hearing from you on you know uh, how you've gone about your work uh, could help to kickstart you know some of our thinking around that and issue a fresh call for some you know some new engagement around that that set of work. But do, I mean, do folks have any um, uh, reactions or input on the degree to which we, you know, for example, through the interest group charge, how we you know, sort of uh, characterize the work that we're doing here? I mean, do we, um, do we want to leave some room or be intentional in the wording of the charge to leave some room for us to, you know, break off and do actual working, you know, spawn working groups from out of the interest group? Um, or do we want to keep things a bit more just sort of engaging at a topical informational level. Um, any strong reactions for or against either of those directions from folks? What well, Leah, you and I could maybe get a little bit clever and creative with the wording to, you know, of our charge to to leave some room for some of that. If that's something you and I are, are interested yeah. in, at least, you know, experimenting with this group on over the course okay. of the year. So yeah, I think that that's all that I had. 
Okay, anybody have anything else before we call it a meeting that they'd like to share, suggest, question? And I think, um, so Nathan, I might want to circle around to you, uh, I'm not sure, or maybe just get in touch with um, whoever's managing the Google Drives um, for all of the various interest groups. I seem to be having a permissions issue with moving things in and out of that, those set of folders, um, something we just didn't catch in the, the transition for whatever reason. Uh, so we do have a new set of notes uh, for this coming year. Those will get, you know, parked in the main Google Drive folder with, um, you know, right alongside of our, our previous year's notes. Um, we'll do, be doing a little bit of cleanup on the, the notes here. Um, but we'll make sure to turn those around and get everybody's attention on them. We'll get the recording from today's call, uh, Jane's presentation linked up into the, uh, the minutes and, and shared over with everybody. Um, Matt, um, we can talk offline, but the, the, the problem you're having is because you're, you're creating them um, as an Educopia user and all of the Google Suite users, um, you can't transfer ownership. So yeah. you need to use a, a generic Gmail account. Um, that's that's a problem in other areas too. That the 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 group sort of managing the Google Drive is aware of because Carol Kussman is the same thing, and I do as well. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of really annoying, and there isn't a great solution except um, you know using a different account at this point. Okay. Yeah, I can do that, and I can you know. Uh, spawn these notes off into a fresh link. Um, folks will just want to pay attention to the link that we share after today's call and and not necessarily bookmarking the one that, <laughs> that we shared over today on the call. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Okay. Yeah, you all set? Yeah, I think so. I think we're all set. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks all. Good call. Bye-bye.